ready, let's go to John chapter 15. Get your Bibles ready for there. While you're looking for John 15, I would like you to also turn to Isaiah chapter number 5. So keep, you, keep your finger uh, in John 15 and, and turn to Isaiah chapter number 5. We'll be going there. And then if you would like to look at another spot, you can go to Matthew chapter 21. Those are the three main passages we're going to be looking at today. Again, just like to remind everyone that we're so very thankful for you mothers, and uh, we love you all, and you do a fantastic job. A lot of it goes unseen and unheard, and uh, just thank you so much for, for you being mothers. Let's move on and go to John chapter number 15. As we reach John chapter 15, it appears that Jesus and his di disciples have just finished the Last Supper, or the Lord's Table, some people call it. And they are now, Jesus told them, let's get up hence and let's move. So they are moving from the place where they were at, uh, having the Last Supper. Now they're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is close to the Mount of Olives. And as they are traveling, Jesus took every advantage, because we need to remind ourselves that he is going to be gone in a matter of hours. I mean, in less than a day, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be crucified and taken off the cross. And so in this short amount of time, the Lord Jesus Christ is taking every advantage to teach the disciples on his way out. Now, he's not necessarily teaching them anything new. He's just emphasizing over and over and over again what their spiritual walk is going to be like, how they can have spiritual power in their life, how God can still use them even though the Lord Jesus Christ is not going to physically be on this earth. And as Jesus continues to instruct him, chapter 15 is very instrumental for a Christian because it gets to the very heart of of serving God. It gets to the very heart of how we can be servants of God and be used of God and be profitable for the Lord's service. Service, And that answer is found in verse number 5. John chapter 15, verse number 5, sums up the most important emphasized verse in this chapter is John 15, verse 5, that sums up the Christian walk, and it's something that we need to remind ourselves daily on. And he says this in verse number 5, Jesus speaking says, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later, what all that means. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Because that's the job of a Christian, to bring forth much fruit. But here's the, here's the kicker. For without me, ye can do nothing. Boy, just let that settle in. Just think about that. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and, and, and you are living for the Lord or you are trying to live for the Lord and yet you forget that I need to rely upon him, re abide in him, remain in him, have an active fellowship with him, or I can do nothing. That means your prayers are going to be ineffective. Your service is ineffective. The vic you probably won't have victory over sin. Yet there's so much that's in court where you're not going to be able to serve the Lord. You are not going to be able to do what God has called you to do. You're not going to be able to stay in the will of God until you and I finally realize that without him, we can do nothing. Because the human life is so prideful. We want to do everything on our own, and then when we get in trouble or when we think we can't handle it, then we want to call on the Lord usually. But we've got to remind ourselves every step of the day, every moment of the day, without Christ, we are not going to be able to do anything that's lasting or beneficial or impactful to this world without Christ. So that's, that's the summary of the Christian walk right there, something that you need to think about. But as I read earlier, he talks about a vine, and he talks about branches. If we go to chapter number 15 and verse number 1, as they're walking to the Gethsemane, Jesus uses this illustration and says, I am, get this, the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Now, a husbandman simply means a farmer. All right, that's all it is. He's the one, the caretaker, the vine dresser, the one that's in charge of the vine. That's what the husbandman is. So that's not hard to figure out. But Jesus Christ is here. I am the true vine. And this vine that he's referring to, of course, is a grapevine. Uh, that is the one that he is referring to. And we're going to study a little bit more about that next week. But what does he mean here when he says, I am the true vine? Obviously, there is an imitation vine. Obviously, there's a vine that has failed and it didn't do the job it was supposed to do, where Jesus Christ can claim that he is the one and only true vine. Well, for us to understand this passage and 
I know it's not a fun Mother's Day message, and I apologize about that, but we need to get the background. We need to get the backdrop of what Jesus is talking about here because we may not understand this. And until you understand that backdrop, you're not going to fully understand what this passage is talking about. So what are the false vines? Or what is this vine that he's referring to? How, how is he the true vine, the right vine, the good vine, the, the, the one vine that produces life as compared to the one that did not produce life? What vine is he referring to? Well, it's not, a, it's not a secret if you've studied your Bible in the Old Testament through the book of Proverbs, through Isaiah, through Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, and all these other areas, the book of Psalms and all these areas, the nation of Israel is considered to be a vine. That is the number one uh, illustration that the Lord uses. In Jeremiah chapter number two, we're not going to turn there, in Jeremiah chapter number two, he says, are you not the chosen vine that I have chosen to bring forth life and fruit? All right, so that's what he says. When Herod created, when Herod created the temple, Herod's temple, that magnificent temple, he used to have, uh, so it says anyway, I, I wasn't there, it's not there anymore, it's all burnt down. But from what the historians say, there was a big circle, and the circle had a giant golden vine on it that represented Israel. All right, And so when the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the true vine, he's saying, I am different than the nation of Israel. Well, why? How, when did the nation of Israel lose its vine power, all right? How did the nation of Israel become a quote-unquote false vine in comparison to Jesus claiming to be the one and true vine? Well, if you remember when God called out Abraham, Abraham was supposed to make the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was supposed to bring the Messiah in. They were supposed to be a light unto the Gentiles. They were supposed to be a light unto the world. They were supposed to bring people, the pagans, to Christ, to God. But instead, they ended up repelling them because they didn't want to be separate for the Lord. They didn't want to be different from the world. Matter of fact, you grow a little bit further and you got with David or before David and they said, we want a king just like the Gentiles. We don't want God to be our king. We're not happy with the judges. We're not happy with the prophets ruling us. We want a, a man to lead us. And, and God said, no, 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 you can't do, no, you don't want that because this is what's going to happen if you get a man leading you. They're going to cause, you know, they're going to take your women. They're going to take your best uh, goods. They are going to tax you. They're going to take your young men. They're going to do all these things to you. You don't want a man ruling over you. You want God to rule over you. But the people rebelled and so God gave in to that. Not that he gave in to man that kind of comes out wrong. It was all within God's plan. But God gave them what they wanted. He still remained sovereign, but he gave them what they wanted. And the nation of Israel has been hurting ever since. Well, they get to the point where they have already disobeyed God. And I want you to see some of the things that God judges them for. Because if we just take a step back, I want to clarify some things. Number one, we are not Israel. Understand that. We did not take the place of Israel. All right, understand that. Christians did not do that. But there are similarities between what the nation of Israel is like and what a local church is supposed to do. There are some strong similarities, though the local church did not take the place of Israel. All right, Romans chapter 11 makes that very clear. The nation of Israel is put on the shelf for a little while, and God is calling out Gentiles, other people that, are worth, that want to worship him, and he is establishing local churches to go out and, and preach the gospel and be a light to this lost and dying world. And then when the rapture happens, when the Lord takes all his saints home, then he's going to go back and work with Israel, and then the nations are going to be judged with how they deal with Israel. So that's the time frame that we're looking at here. So there are some very close similarities of Israel with a local church. Now here's the problem. I think the local church has lost its power because we're more like the nation of Israel. And if we can go back and see why God judged the nation of Israel, it can cause us to pause and look at our church and say, now, is our church doing these type of things? Or you can get a little bit more personal. Not only is this church doing this, is my family doing this? Or get a little bit more personal. Am I doing this? Am I some of the reasons why we are not the lighthouse, we are not the, uh, uh, the gospel-bearing lighthouse that we ought to be in our community? Because there's going to be some, uh, like I said, applications here. So let's go back and see when God first started judging them. He makes it very clear of calling them out to be a vine, and then he gives his judgments on them. Take your Bible and go to Isaiah chapter number 5. 
God pronounces six woes on that nation for what they have done. Isaiah chapter number 5, verse number 1, the Word of God says, Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. So he's saying, okay, We've been called his vineyard. We've been called out of Israel, uh, out of uh, Egypt. We've been called a, a vine that's supposed to produce life. God has given us his law. God has given us his tabernacle. God has given us everything so that we could be separate. He's given us the seventh day rest. He's given us food restrictions, clothing restrictions. He's given us stuff in our lives that we are supposed to be completely separate and be a vine that produces fruit for God. So Isaiah is now saying, I'm going to talk to you about this. Now remember, this is right before they went into captivity. I'm going to tell you something about this vine now. I'm going to paint this picture of what this vine is like. This is his well-beloved touching his vine. He says, my well-beloved, meaning God, hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. So the first thing we notice is that the hill part, where it's going to receive enough nutrition, it's going to receive enough light, it's going to see, receive just the amount of, right amount of water, it's a place that the, this vine should grow, the, that the grapes should be produced without any problem. So the problem's not where it's been called out to be. It's not stuck in a desert somewhere. It's not stuck in depleted soil. It is a fruitful place. He said, I want to talk about this, that this vine, your, this vineyard, is in a fruitful hill. Verse number two, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built the tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked, that it should bring forth grapes. All right, so God says here, through his prophet, I have done everything possible for this vine to be able to have the best opportunity to produce the best grapes. I fenced it in to keep the wild animals out. I've taken out the stone so it stays up that fertile soil so it has a perfect opportunity to grow. Uh, he's gathered out the stones thereof. He's planted with the choicest vine. He didn't buy the cheap stuff over at Walmart. All right, He didn't find some gross little weed somewhere and put it in there. He found the best possible seed he could possibly do to plant this vineyard. And then it says, and then he built a tower in the midst of it, meaning that he protected it. No one was going to stomp on it. No bigger animals were going to be able to trot on it. No people were going to steal from it. God has provided everything for this vineyard. He's given it his choicest place. He's fenced it. He did the weeding. He cleaned it all out. He purged it. He got it set up, and it's growing. And his ex, oh, he has a wine press there. So the idea simply is that right at the same spot, the grapes are going to do what they're supposed to do, produce that beautiful grape juice, uh, that 100% uh, that beautiful grape juice that is going to be able to be pressed out and, and do what was supposed to do all right so it's, it's exactly it's the perfect setting for the best vineyard you could possibly have to function in the best possible way and he made a wine press therein and he looked that it should bring forth grapes so God says okay I've done it all right I've given it everything what more could I do now what I am expecting God says is I'm expecting good grapes I'm expecting grapes that I can take, and they're not going to be rotten. They're not going to be nasty. They're not going to be foul. They're going to taste beautiful. They are going to have, uh, you know, all the, all the reservatol or anything else that it's supposed to have there. This is gonna, I'm expecting choice grapes to come out of this thing. But look what it produced. And it brought forth wild grapes. Now, I've been doing a lot of study on grapes, and I'm going to look at a, see if I can bring a video in for next week as we look at what it means to prune and the things like that. I think when you get a, physical, uh, a visual representation of that, it kind of starts, wow, that's amazing what God does for us. But here, he's saying, I want grapes. And, and when these people, especially in Israel, and they make these grapes, they're big, beautiful grapes for the wine press. But then they showed this area where there were just wild grapes growing. They're small. They're gross. You would have some, some would be a plump grape, and then the other ones next to it kind of like shriveled up. So some were shriveled and some were there. And they said, you can't make wine out of that. You can't. Those things are basically worthless. The wild grapes are worthless. The only thing they're pretty much good for is perhaps maybe sustaining you if you're stuck in the desert and you come across that and you are dying of thirst. Then that might be able to help you some. But wild grapes are absolutely worthless. They don't belong in a, vine, a wine press. They don't belong in a, in, a, in a harvesting situation. You don't even pay attention to them because they are just worthless. And so God says, look what I've done. Here's the, here's the parable of the vineyard. I've gotten this vineyard all set up. Israel's supposed to be my vineyard. I've done everything for it. And I'm looking for that vineyard to produce those grapes, those fruits that are going to honor and glorify me. But instead, 
It's producing wild grapes. He goes on in verse number 3, and he says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Remember, this is right before they're entering into captivity. God's giving them a chance to get things right. And he says, you want to know why I'm judging you? He said, you stand now and judge. Whose fault is it that these grapes did not get produced? Whose fault is it that this vineyard is not working? You make the judge. Even human beings, even simple human beings, can differentiate between whose fault it is, whether it is God's fault or the nation of Israel's fault. Right? It's very simple whose fault it is. It's not God's fault. Matter of fact, look what he says in verse number 4. This is God speaking as a, as a lawyer. And he says, What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Boy, that's a striking statement. God says, What else could I have done? I've given you everything. I've protected you. I've watched over you. I've given you the choicest grapes. I've purged you. I've cleansed you. I've called you out. I'm your protector. I'm your provider. I've given you everything. What more could I have done for you? Wow. Now apply that to the church, the local church. What more could God do for us? He's given us a place to meet. He's given us families, young ones, older ones, Older, older ones. He's given us the Word of God. Matter of fact, He's given us the Holy Spirit of God to live inside of us. He's given us sanctification, preservation, like we're studying on Wednesday night. He's given us everything He could possibly give to us. What kind of fruit are you producing? If we were to take into this and we were to go to a courtroom setting and God were to stand there and say, now judge between me and them. Whose fault is this? What more could I possibly do for Lighthouse Baptist Church? What more could I possibly do for, put your family name in there. What more could I possibly do for, put your name in there. Why are they producing wild grapes? What more could I possibly do? He goes on. Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes? God is... We know he's not, but from a human perspective, just to, to clarify, God is perplexed here. It doesn't make sense. I've planted the choicest grapes. Why aren't they producing the right stuff? What's going on with this people? What's going on with this nation? What's going on with these people? Why are they doing all this rotten things? Well, now he's going to produce six woes on that nation and say Why? they are now going to be judged. Saying why that their grapes have not been the fruitful ones to produce beautiful wine, but instead it is going to be the wild grapes that are useless and worthless and rotting away and good for nothing. Well, let's look at some of these woes and see perhaps maybe if these things haven't crept into our lives, and maybe that's why we're producing wild grapes rather than fruit, God's fruit that we're supposed to do. He starts off in verse number 8. You're going to see this because all of these are going to be produced. By, they're all going to be pronounced by a woe. The woe means like, boy, you better pay attention. There's a curse on this because of what they're doing. Whenever God puts a woe there, pay attention because he does not like it. He does not want it in your lives. He doesn't want it named among today Christians, and he didn't want it named among the Israelites during that day. And look what he says here in verse number 8. He says, woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of a homer shall yield an epheth. He's basically saying that they have become greedy. They have become materialistic. They wanted to be isolated. They wanted to have house after house after house after house. They wanted to have vineyard after vineyard after vineyard after vineyard. They wanted to be greedy. They had sufficient enough for them, but they wanted more, and they wanted more, and they weren't satisfied with it, even if it wasn't at the expense of what God would ask them to do. Matter of fact, one of the main reasons why they got thrown into the captivity is because they didn't follow the plan for planting that God gave them. He said, you can plant for six years, but on the seventh year, you can't plant anymore because the earth needs to rejuvenate. But don't worry, I'll take care of you in that seventh year. But you know what? If I stop working on that seventh year, if I start farming on that seventh year, that means I really have to trust in God to take care of me. That means I'm going to be out a lot of money 
because I can harvest a lot of things and I can plant a lot. So I'm more imp- I want to get more fields and I want to have more houses because I want to make more money. That's the whole idea behind it. You become very greedy. And when a person becomes greedy, they don't need God anymore. When money becomes their object, their money becomes their God. Their work becomes their God. And when all they want is money, then they'll forsake church, they'll forsake reading of the Bible, they'll forsake serving because they're too busy to do those things. Because they're greedy. They're greedy. And God said, I, I've had enough of that. Matter of fact, they could have all their houses, they could have all their fields, but guess what's going to happen when they get taken into captivity? They're going to be desolate. They're going to end up with nothing. Absolutely nothing. Let's look at the second woe he produces in verse number 11. He says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning. That they, oh, see, it's supposed to be good to rise up early, right? The early bird gets the worm or something like that. It's supposed to be good to rise up early. But look at the reason why they were rising up early. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, not to work, not to worship the Lord, not to pray, not to read their Bibles, but they rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink that continue until night till wine inflame them. And the harp and the veal and the tabre and the pipe and the wine are in their feast. But they regard not the work of the Lord. Neither consider the operation of His hands. God says they substitute entertainment for the Lord's work. They are more consumed about their own entertainment, whether it was the music, whether it was the feasts, whether it was the drinking or whatever they wanted to do. They wanted to party. They wanted to have fun. They wanted to be entertained rather than serve the Lord. My, is that not a problem we have today? Our society is bent on entertainment. You can have entertainment anytime, every time, whatever time you want. You can get entertainments on your cell phones. You get entertainments on your computer, entertainments on TV. No matter where you go, you're bombarded with amusements and entertainment. And sometimes we get so caught up in our entertainment that we don't take time to serve the Lord. We neglect the things of the Lord. We pay no regard or attention to the things of the Lord because we are more consumed with entertainment. You look at how some churches have gone and how it's, you know, when I was doing a study here on how to do a church when no one can show up and, and looking at all these big church thinkers and stuff like that and how to be very effective in your church ministry though people are watching on the internet and boy, they had all kinds of stuff what you need to do there. Make sure you flash up a bunch of pictures. Make sure you have your PowerPoints all set up. Make sure that you don't preach more than 15 minutes because when people are watching online, they can only last for about 15 minutes and then they're going to lose attention and they're going to get distracted by something in the home. So you only have a 15-minute time. You've got to do this and you've got to do that. And Unbelievable. If you want to capture their attention, have lots of singing. Have lots of specials. Have lots of things to entertain them. You look at what the world offers. You've got to have a coffee house in a church now. You've got to give up donuts in a church now. You've got to have rock bands in a church. You've got to have a spotlight on people playing their music. You've got to have the big fanfare and the booms and all the bells and whistles. And you've got to have uh, you know, color screen TVs and, and short little snippets here. and short. Little... You've got to entertain people because we're so filled with entertainment. People can't even stop for one day to go to church without being entertained. And then the pastor can't preach the word of God. No, 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 he can't do that. He's got to tell jokes. He's got to tell stories. He's got to say things that captivate people's attention. So much so that I'm going to copyright my material. I'm going to copyright my joke. I'm going to copyright that sermon illustration. Boy, we've gone a long way. For a lot of us, we don't regard the work of the Lord. We're too busy entertaining ourselves. He goes on, skips, let's move on down because he talks about judgment there and we're going to move past that judgment. And let's go to verse number 18. It's, here's the next woe that is listed. He says, Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. They say, Let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. They have unwillingness to give up their sin. 
They have their pet sins that they want to do. And that's just like them having it on a cart over there. And instead of them, uh, you know, trying to stay away from sin, boy, they have it on a rope. And they start pulling it. And they start dragging it to them. We want our sin so much. We don't want it to go away. We don't want to lose it. We don't want to get it out of our lives. I'm going to have it on a string. So any old time I want to sin, I can pull those cords. And don't talk to me about God's judgment. Let it come, they say. Let him do his work hastily. He hasn't shot me down yet. He hasn't hit me with a, a, a lightning bolt yet. And I've been doing this secret sin for all these years, for all these months, for all these days. And I'm still living. Everything's still going good. Everything's going great. So let him come hasty. Do what you got to do. But I want my sin. And they drag it in there. They have an unwillingness to give up their sin. Boy, again, Christian, let me ask you, how many times have you prayed, Lord, see if there's some secret thing in me and let me get rid of it? How many of us realize there are certain pet sins we have in our lives, like, a, like the old poker players that have that ace in their pocket? And any time they thought they were going to lose, they'd pull that ace out. Too many of us have sins like that. It's still attached to some cord in our life. It's still attached to some area in our heart. And instead of cutting it and getting rid of it out of our lives, we keep it on a chain so that we can flirt with it, play with it, experience it when we want. And then we let it go a little bit so it looks like we're away from it, but we never really gave it up. Well, that's why he judged the nation of Israel. They had an unwillingness to get rid of their sins in their lives. Jump down to verse number 20. Woe unto them, he says. This is the one, two, three, fourth woe. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. What does this mean? They're mocking God's holiness. They're mocking God's character. God, you say it's evil? I say that it's good. I like it. You say that it's dark and I should stay away from it? I'm calling it light. I'm having a lot of fun with that. They are mocking God's character. They are mocking God's holiness. They say, God says, stay away. It's bitter. It's nasty. Get away from it. And they say, no, I'm enjoying it too much. It's sweet. They're saying everything exact opposite of what God is saying. God says, don't. And they say, I will. God says, stay away. They say, I'm going to go. God says, they don't have any knowledge about that. They say, I'm going to turn the light on and experience it full blown. Pretty nasty what the nation of Israel dwelled down to when they were supposed to be that choice vineyard. They were supposed to be producing those great grapes. God gave them everything possible to do that. And yet they're bringing forth this wild grapes, this useless stuff, calling evil good, light, a dark light, and bittersweet. Well, let's move on to the fifth one. Verse number 21. He says, woe well unto them, oh, that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Basically, they don't need God. They don't need to seek God. They don't need to trust God. They don't have to read God's word. They don't have to pray to God. They don't have to depend on God. They can simply say, I can handle this. I can do what I want. I'm wise in my own ways. I'm prudent. I, I can get things done. And I don't have to search God's word to see what's right or wrong. I know what's right or wrong for my own life. I don't have to seek out God. I don't need God at all in my life. I can handle this life on my own. How often do Christians do that? How often do we, instead of going to the Word of God and finding out what God would have us to do, we turn to the world. We turn to counselors. Some people turn to drugs. Some people turn to alcohol. Some people turn to books written by atheists. Books written by secular people. Books written by nominal Christians or liberal Christians so they can justify what they're doing and say, I don't need God. I don't got it. I got it figured out. I can handle this. I know how to raise my kids. I know how to be a good husband. I know how to be a good father. I don't need God to instruct me. I know what's best for my finances. I know how much I'm supposed I know what I can do. Watch out. When you become prudent in your own eyes, when you become wise in your own eyes, God takes a back seat. And this is one of the reasons why God said, those are wild grapes. I don't want that. That's not what I'm looking for. And then finally, the last one in verse number 22. He says, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine 
and men of strength to mingle strong drink, and here's what they did, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Their judgments are perverted. They are not doing what is best for God. They are not doing what is right. They are not saying that, okay, this person was righteous. Let's praise them and let's exalt them. No, they take away that righteousness. I can't help but think of what our nation is doing to President Trump. He is doing the best he can. He's trying to shut down Planned Parenthood. Who wouldn't be behind that? He's trying to stop the abortions in our country. Who wouldn't be behind that? And yet there are still Christians that are fighting against President Trump. Still say, oh, he's a wicked man. He's done this. He's done that. He has others go. You are stripping away that righteousness from that man. Look what he's trying to do, and yet people are still going after him. And there are some so-called or so-named Christians that are even doing it. Your judgment is perverted. Your judgment is wrong. You are judging things as if you were drunk like the world. Because what happens when a person gets drunk? Their thinking is impaired. They don't see things the way that it really is. I remember when I used to drink. I didn't drink a whole bunch, but I remember in the ring car I used to drink. And guess what? After I get drunk, I thought I was Mr. Tough Guy. And I thought I could beat anybody up. I think I could beat up like 17 guys. Why? I wasn't thinking clearly. I wasn't thinking soberly. I wasn't thinking accurately. I had a very perverted thought. And then it wasn't long before I woke up and realized I couldn't do that the next day. You understand how that goes? When you are drunk, you do things you ought not to do. That's why the Bible says stay away from alcohol. You're not in your right mind. You're not in your sound mind. You're not with quick judgment. Your judgment is perverted. So why do Christians want to push that they can drink? When the Bible is against it. When you start drinking and alcohol gets in your system, you start being perverted in your thinking. Maybe not sexually perverted like a lot of people think. I'm, well, that happens too. But I'm talking about perverted. Your judgments are all mixed up. And you start saying that the wicked, the wicked things you do, you start justifying it. And the righteous things you're supposed to do, you strip it away. I don't need to do that anymore. One of my greatest fears for the local church nowadays is everybody's going to get too comfortable with what we got right now. Why go back to church? I like being at home. I like being able to get up and not have to dress and eat my breakfast and eat my Cheerios in front of a screen. I like when I'm kind of, you know, I don't like what the pastor say. I can kind of put my finger on there. I can kind of fast forward a little bit. And then I don't have to listen to that part. And I'll just listen to this part over here. Or I'll just check this. Or you know what? I don't like that thing, so I'm just going to shut it off and walk away. One of my fears is people aren't going to want to come to church anymore. Yeah, because it's not convenient. It's not convenient to get up and get dressed and get everything going and then come back to a place and worship with one another. That's a great fear of mine. You're going to strip away the righteous. You're going to justify wicked things. Not saying that staying at home right now is wicked. You understand what I'm saying. But you can justify that. And you can strip away the things that God would like us to do. Be careful. Don't act like drunk people. Matter of fact, Peter says that too. He said, don't, don't be like those that are in the darkness. Your life should be shining for the Lord. You should be living for holiness. You should have a sound mind. You should be clear. You should be sober. How often does the word of God say, be sober, be sober, be sober? It's because he's correlating the idea that a drunk mind is perverted. A drunk mind changes things. A drunk mind sees things the way it wants to see it, not based on reality, but their own silly perceptions rather than the truth of the word of God or the truth that's before them. And they start perverting their judgment. Well, because of that, jump down to verse number 26. God says, you know what's going to happen to you now? Because you were this choice vineyard, and because this was supposed to be done for you, and because I did all these things, there's absolutely nothing else I could do for you that I could possibly do, but you have done these six things instead. He jumps down to verse number 26 and says, and he will lift up an ensign, an ensign is a flag, to the nations from afar, and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth, and behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. God says, I have judgments coming. You produce those wild grapes. uh, You have done these six foolish things. You were greedy. You substituted entertainment for the Lord's work. You are unwilling to give up your sin. You mock God's holiness. You don't seek after God. You don't need God, and you perverted your judgments. Now, because of that, I'm judging you, and there's not going to be a stop. Once I raise that ensign, there's no turning back. You guys are going straight into captivity. Well, we move on forward a little bit as we discover this uh, this fruit of the vine or this vine theory of, see, they were supposed to produce life, but instead they only produced death. They produced sin. And this is why Jesus is calling himself the true vine as compared to that false vine. 
or better yet, inadequate vine, a failed vine, a vine that should have been doing what it's supposed to do, but it didn't do it. So Jesus is saying, no, I'm that true vine. It wasn't Israel. Israel is not where you get your spiritual strength from. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. But what did, once this judgment happened, and they were taken into captivity, you would think that would straighten them out. And it did for a little while. It did straighten the Jewish nation out. But ultimately, instead of accepting their Messiah to put that vine on the earth, they rejected him. Go to your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 21. Here's a short parable. Now this is only a day or so before Jesus Christ claims to be the vineyard or claims to be the vine. All right. So this is a backdrop. This would be fresh in the apostle's mind. Maybe, I don't know if it's fresh there, but he talked about this before the, the Last Supper. And in Matthew chapter number 21, verse number 33, Jesus is explaining why this vineyard is being ripped out and he is going to be the true vine rather than the nation of Israel. He gives a short summary of it all. And he says this in verse 33. He says, here another parable. There was a certain household, this is of course referring to God in the parable, which planted a vineyard that of course was Israel. All right, we just showed that. All right, so this is what he did. And hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to a husbandman and went into a far country. So God basically saying, look, I've given the nation of Israel. I planted that vineyard. I've protected it. I got it all set up, ready to go. Everything's ready here. But they rejected me as their king. So I'm not going to be their theocracy king anymore. I'm going to lend it out to another husbandman. I'm going to lend it out to the kings. I'm going to lend it out to the scribes and Pharisees. Those are, I'm going to give someone else to help take care of that vineyard while I'm gone since they didn't want me to be there. All right? So that's the picture that he's drawing. He goes on in verse 34. And when the time of the fruit drew near, so it's time to get that fruit, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. What is that talking about? Well, when we studied the nation of Israel, we went through the book of Kings and other areas. We found out that the kings that were in charge, when they had a prophet that they didn't like, they'd kill him. They'd put him in jail. When they had a man of God come to them and speak the truth, they wanted nothing to do with him. They'd mock him. They'd get rid of him. They'd stick him in uh, uh, prisons and other things like that. So God said, hey, it's time to gather that fruit. I'm sending my prophets there. And what did you guys do? You beat them, you stoned them, and you killed them. But God didn't stop there. He gives them another chance in verse 36. And again, he sent other servants, more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. But notice what he does now. But last of all, so he's done sending the prophets of the Old Testament. They've killed all of them, ending with John the Baptist. I, they've killed all of them, the nation of Israel has. And so this is what he says. But last of all, he sent unto them his son saying, they will reverence my son. So God says, all right, here's this vineyard, and I've given them a husbandman, and it's time to gather the fruits. But instead of gathering fruits, they just murder, kill, and maim, and they've done it over and over and over again, no matter how time and times I've sent to them. So finally the husbandman says, I'm going to send my son. Surely they're going to reverence him. Surely they're going to respect him. Surely they're going to bow to him because they don't own that vineyard. There is only lent to them. It was a stewardship to them. And they need to respect my son. Surely they're going to do it. They will reverence my son. Verse 28. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. It's truly his. Come! Let us kill him. And let us seize on his inheritance. Right there shows you the motivation of the scribes and the Pharisees, the leaders of the nation of Israel at that time. They didn't want to give up that vineyard. Their hearts were, no, we know it belongs to him. He is the Messiah who he claims to be. We see by his works, his testimonies, everything that's there. We see by the word of God, he yeah, is that, but we don't want him to rule and reign over us. So we're going to kill him. We're going to take everything away so we can stay in power of this vineyard. So what do they do in verse 39? And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him, of course, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ or crucifixion of Christ talked about there. Verse 40, when the Lord thereof, the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They're going to be held accountable for what they've done. Now notice what he says here, next verse. 
they say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, which is true, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which should render him the fruits in their seasons. So they came up with the right answer when he's talked to these scribes and Pharisees. They said, well, if that was the Lord, uh, of the, he was in charge of that vineyard, and that's all they did to his servants, and they did to his servants, and then they did to his son, well, then all you can expect him to do is to destroy them, kick them out, and put someone else in charge of it. Luke says in verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. He's basically saying... I'm that one. I'm that son that you're rejecting. Therefore say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Now we understand from the book of Romans, it is only for a short time, a parenthetical time. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Hence, the local church age, or you could call it the kingdom of God where now in today's age, fewer Jews are being saved, but from this time on, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, from Acts chapter number 10, more Gentiles have been saved. More Gentile churches. You take the number of churches that honor and worship the Lord in Gentile areas as compared to the nation of Israel, we far outnumber them, right? That's just the way that it goes because they are still stuck in the old wineskins. But Jesus Christ said, I'm going to, you're right, I'm going to take them away for a while and I'm going to use another nation. I'm those that don't call my name, meaning that non-Jews, and I'm going to establish my kingdom with them. Now that's going to be interesting when we get to that parable because he's talking about the kingdom of God, not the nation of Israel. And then he finishes off and says in verse 44, And whosoever shall fall on this sword shall be broken. Meaning that if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ your Savior, you're going to be broken of your sins and put your faith in him. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So if you don't trust Christ as your Savior, that stone is going to mush you. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard this parable, his parables, get this, they perceived that he spake of them. They knew exactly what he was saying and claiming to be the Son of God. And yet they rejected. Go over to John chapter number 15, and we'll close up. With that background in mind, Jesus claims in verse number one, I am the true vine. And you want to know who the true husbandman is? It's not the local churches, it's not pastors, it's not the nation of Israel, it's not scribes and Pharisees. The one that's really in charge of this harvest is the Father. The Father's in charge of it all. And so in comparison to Israel and the foolishness that I'm with, went on with that, and, the, and when Jesus was around them claiming because they were Israelites that they were children of God and they were going to go to heaven, he said, no, 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 no. I'm the true vine. I am the true vine, Jesus is saying, as compared to that false one. My father's the, the, the farmer, and you know what you guys are? You're going to be the branches. Now, there's going to be something that the Lord is going to do to those branches. The Father is going to be inspecting the branches. And like we read in verse number 5, He's expecting you to bring forth much fruit. Not wild grapes. Not the, not the woes. Not the greed. Not the entertainment. That's not what He's expecting you to produce. He wants you to produce much more fruit fruit. So he's going to look at this vineyard, and he's going to start doing some things. He's going to cleanse it up. He's going to do it. He's going to get it all set up so they can produce the right type of fruit that it's supposed to produce. We'll cover that next week, how the Father is going to do that, and how we, as Christians, can get some of this filth out of our lives, cleanse ourselves. How do we cleanse ourselves? And then how do we produce more fruit? Because that's what God's expecting in our lives, to produce fruit. Oh, and by the way, what are those fruits? What should I be seeing in my life? We'll cover that as well next week. Well, I don't, we'll cover that. You know, we'll, we'll get all of it in there. So I want to go ahead and give you that background. I know it's not a very fun Mother's Day message, and I do apologize for that. But it is a good background. It is a good gut checker. It is a good way to look at ourselves and to see where do we really stand with the Lord, whether it's with our local church here, or whether it's with your family, or whether it's you as an individual. Check your heart. Do you have these things that is stopping you from producing fruit in your life? God wants it cleansed. God wants it out of there so that you could have joy and, and live for him. 
Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll be dismissed. Again, mothers, we love you, and thank you so much for all that you do for your families. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, even though this was a background here, and we got a lot of things we can learn about here, about that false vine and the false things people trust in and how they produced wild grapes rather than the fruit, even though, like you said in the questioning, like a lawyer would say, what more could you have done for them? What more could you do? And I look at my own heart, Father. What more could you do for me? You saved me. You cleansed me. You justified me. One day I'm going to be glorified with you. You've made me heirs with Christ. Father, you've adopted me in your family. You've given me your Holy Spirit. You give me your word. You give me a, a loving wife and a faithful mother and children. And Father, you, you have done so much. Why then do we produce those wild grapes? Oh Lord, I pray that we would look at our hearts and we would get those things right. Help us, Father, to go through the pruning and the cleansing so that we can produce more fruit and even much fruit to your honor and glory. Father, I'd like to pray again a special prayer for the mothers and for all the ladies that are out there, whether they are mothers or not. May they realize how special they are, not only in our sight as men, but in the sight of you, Father. And you've created them with purpose and plan. And Father, this world would be absolutely horrendous without the love of the ladies in the proper fashion, the love of a mother. So Father, I pray that they would take their role seriously. I pray that they would do what you've called them to do, whether it being just the faithful wives to their husbands, whether it's getting themselves ready to become wives or, or, or to become mothers. Father, that you would watch over them and keep them safe. And the ones that are mothers right now and have children, help them to be invested in their children's lives, help them to influence them in the proper things in the nurture and admonition of you. Father, may they fulfill what you've called them to do. Give them your grace to be that Proverbs 31 woman. Give them their grace to just to live for you. Thank you again for all of them. I pray that you would give them a special blessing as we remember their uh, things that they do today. Please watch over them and keep them safe. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a great Mother's Day. Thank you for coming.